This is the site of Oliver Perez pitching for the Arizona Diamondbacks on April 24th, 2022. He doesn't have a particularly good outing this afternoon in Phoenix, and he's having a terrible start to the season. It is unfortunately becoming pretty clear that his time as a big league pitcher is running out. When his day ends, it could very well be the last time he's ever stood on a big league mound. And you know what? That's not all bad. Because Oliver Perez was not supposed to be here. His career looked like it was over, completely dead in the water, more than 10 years before this. This is the extraordinary career of Oliver Perez. I've done the full season-by-season -season review treatment for three players, if I, if I can get my fingers there right, so far. Manny Ramirez, who has now garnered four videos from me. Ricky Henderson, who it took an hour and 17 minutes to fully explore. And Sid Finch, who never played in one season, and a particularly large amount of people now know that. Ollie, as I'm gonna call him throughout this video, had one of the more interesting careers I've ever followed. I believe he should get that full, no stone unturned treatment too. And as a baseball fan born in 1999, he was a constant of watching baseball for a very long time. Ali, the Mariners missing the playoffs, and Pharrell looking 300 years younger than he actually is, had always been there, consistently being a part of life. The Mariners have just made it, Pharrell's mustache makes him look 299 years younger than he actually is, hi Luis Severino, and Ali looks like he's left a mound for the last time. But how did we get here? Before Ali was a master at rocking silver hair, he was a 20-year-old rookie on the 2002 San Diego Padres. On June 16th, 2002, a wide-eyed, hard-throwing 20-year-old lefty from Mexico took the mound in his first ever big league game. The first batter he ever faced in the majors was Ichiro, and he struck him out swinging. Baseball is so easy. I already knew that though, because I have a 500 OBP against Division I baseball players. Ollie would find that out over the course of his rookie season, which was still very good. Baseball is so not easy, by the way, let's just be clear there. A 350 ERA in 16 games and 90 innings. Walks were a bit of a problem for Ali, but he made up for it by being one of the best strikeout getting young lefties in the game. He finished his rookie season with an ERA 7% above league average when you factor in his competition and the stadiums he pitched in, but he was still very clearly a work in progress. 2003 showed that. Whatever differences were in his ERA and FIP definitely came closer together now. On the mound for the 2003 Padres, his ERA was 538 in 18 starts. What do you think of that, Nate Silver? This was definitely your fault. Actually, it's pretty hard to blame the 538 guy when you're walking five and a half batters every nine innings and rocking a 74 ERA+. plus. But as a man only just old enough to legally purchase alcohol in the United States, he definitely had some room to grow and had value to blossom into. The Pittsburgh Pirates saw that. The Padres gave up on Ali, trading him to the Pirates in August of his second year. Along with Jason Bay, Meadow World Peace's alleged friend, Jason Bay. Grab a shake shack with my man Jason Bay. Now, people today generally associate being a pitcher on the Pirates as a bad thing. There's a long list of young pitchers the Pirates had that went on to be way, way better after saying goodbye to Pittsburgh, or when the team made them walk the plank. Nah, that joke is awful, I'm so sorry. Ali looked like he could be one of those guys too. His numbers really didn't get any better in his first crack at things with the Pirates. But all of a sudden, with more time to work with him and tap into his potential, Ali would become one of the very best pitchers in the game as soon as 2004 started. Problem was, nobody noticed. I'm gonna preface everything I'm about to say with arguably the most insane Ali fact of them all. Through his age 23 season, the pitcher he was most statistically similar to by similarity score is Sandy Koufax. Like, the Sandy Koufax who is considered one of the greatest pitchers in the history of baseball. Ollie would finish fourth in the National League in strikeouts in 2004 while posting an ERA under three. Tied for fifth in the NL there. A fire-throwing lefty in the early 2000s? Sure we're not talking about Strider here? No, not Spencer Strider. 
This Strider had his chamomile tea that day. And in just 196 innings, Ali's 239 strikeouts made him the only qualified pitcher in all of baseball to reach a strikeout rate of 11 per nine innings. So he was the very best strikeout getting starting pitcher in baseball on a per inning basis. On a fastball that at 93 miles an hour averaged out as the sixth hardest in all of baseball. Wow, sign of the times there, am I right? No one really cared though. You couldn't find him at the All-Star Game, and his name didn't even show up on one voter's Cy Young ballot. Not even in really small print. Not even the smallest blot possible like on Mr. Krabs' first dollar. Robbie Ray won the award in 2021 with, like, extremely similar numbers. Ali didn't make it in the top nine finishers. I think I could figure out why. His ERA at the end of June was 338. His record was just 3-4. and four. In 13 starts, the Pirates just could not get anything going in, like, a very noticeable portion of his starts. He finished the year 12-10. and 10. He allowed three runs or fewer in 83.3% of his starts. Pirates, do something. He even got the walks more under control than ever before. Not as many walks and a ton of strikeouts? You'd think the Pirates were facing Oliver Perez in every one of their games. But no, you guys made him lose a 1-0 game to the guy who tried to throw an umpire out of the game. I'm sure Pirates fans remember that. What Pirates fans definitely remember is how Ollie would never come even close to that level in Pittsburgh ever again. It seemed like he had this crazy knack for starting off really well with a team early in his career and then just combusting down to an ERA your dad probably thinks he could do better than. He can't. I'll just say that. I'd take your dad 450 to dead center if I ever got the chance. Something I distinctly remember is being six years old and waking up three hours before school to play MLB 06 the show. Pretty sure I've mentioned that in videos before, actually. I don't know how, but I still remember every time you'd start Ollie in a game there, Matt Vaskersian would always bring up a broken toe of his from 2005. That's a guy that still has a very bright future, but injury problems, including a broken toe, really curtailed his growth last season. Dead serious, it took one video's worth of searching to find that, by the way. Anyways, the point I was going to make is Ollie broke that toe kicking something in a fit of rage after losing a game in 2005 to the Cardinals. He somehow finished 2005 with a winning record, but Ollie faced every kind of baseball struggle you could dream up. 2006 was even worse. By 24, he was already a falling star. A 2-10 and 10 record with a 6.63 ERA for the Pirates in 2006 was a new low. Hey, well, at least he had 10 non-broken toes this time. His velo was dropping from 2004. His control was a severe problem in 05 that wasn't getting any better. Actually, I lied. He was cutting his walks down by one-tenth of a hitter every nine innings. Any form of consistency he had went out the window. Opening day was a great start. He shoved in the first ever World Baseball Classic 2, helping kick the star-studded US team out in just the second round. But any good from this time was completely drowned by bad. It even included a demotion to the minors. He understood it though. He acknowledged that he had a problem with his mechanics and getting in his own head when things started to go wrong. So the Pirates traded him to the Mets, who only needed arms because one of their best relievers was injured in a taxi accident. We've got a video on that already. What's crazy is the numbers didn't even improve once he stepped foot on the mound for the Mets in 2006. His numbers even looked ugly in the minors that year, with the Mets and the Pirates. He did set a record with the 2006 Mets though, one that is kind of impressive the more you read it. He had the highest regular season ERA of any pitcher to ever start a playoff game. So the worst run preventer ever asked to start a playoff game, if you just go by ERA and the timing of the game. This for a 97 win team that was clearly the best in baseball, but was running out of any and all healthy arms. Ollie was healthy, and he existed, so the Mets needed to count on him to make a push to the World Series, which seemed like their destiny. Starting Game 4 of the National League Championship Series against the Cardinals, he got tattooed again. Five and two-thirds innings, five runs, all earned, three home runs allowed, but the Mets were still hanging on. They made it all the way to a Game 7 at home where the winner would go on to the World Series. The Mets, the clear favorite starting all the way back in April, and the Cardinals, a team with a good degree of star power on it, but clocking in at just 83 regular season wins. 
the man in charge of moving the Mets on. Oliver Perez makes the start for the Mets on short rest. Two out. Here against Oliver Perez. Pops it up out behind the second base position. Green, fast. And he ends the inning with a strikeout. Back in there, and Wilson strikes out, one away. Shattered back, right at third. Out at second, double play. Pujols pops it up. Jose Reyes and Willie Randolph says forget the book. Ali was dealing, holding the Cardinals to just one run in the sixth inning. But trouble did start to manifest shortly after. With one out in the top of the sixth inning, he couldn't put Jim Edmonds away and gave the Cardinals a free base runner. What happened next scared the bejeebus out of every single Mets fan and Cardinals hater in the universe. Going after Scott Rowland. And Scott Rowland hits one into deep left field. Back at the wall. Wow. You want to talk about a team of destiny? Ali was saved, the Mets were saved, and Andy Chavez became a household name, who may or may not have had trouble remembering just which awesome catch I'm talking about. What catch are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> this ended Ali's night. He left the game having went six really strong innings, handing it over to what had been a really solid Mets bullpen. However, Yadier Molina had other plans as did Adam Wainwright. I think this was definitely the last time those two ever played together. It's impossible for a pitcher-catcher duo to survive from this game in 2006 to say, 2022. No shot. Ollie's story continued with the Mets in 2007, where he actually rode the momentum off that great start pretty well. 15 wins, the best walk rate he'd had in a season since that 2004 season, his best whip since 2004, and his ERA went from 32% below league average in 2006 to 21% above league average in 2007. He was a mainstay in the rotation for one of the best teams in baseball. That is, one of the best teams in baseball from April through August. Blowing a 7-game lead in the division with 17 games to play is not the focus here. Ali is. 2008 would be the last year of his rookie contract, and it served as a slight step backwards from 2007. Most of his rate stats weren't that different. His ERA just jumped 66 points in 17 more innings. The likely cause of this is that he led all of Major League Baseball in walks with 105. It was weird. He was really good at preventing hits and striking guys out, but walking the farm along with it. This is year 7 for Ali, not year 1. You can't really keep doing that and expect to be above average. Oh, would you look at that? He wound up being exactly average. But he needed to be electric on September 28th, 2008. What I purposefully avoided telling you was that the Mets were clinging on for dear life in the playoff race again in 2008, needing a win about as badly as Dash's teacher in The Incredibles wanted to bust him for pretty much anything. He moves right there! Ollie was the man who needed to pitch the Mets into their future again. In what would be the very last regular season game at Shea Stadium, Ollie needed to shut down the Florida Marlins. For five innings, he did just that. Five solid, shutout innings. Even better than Game 7 of 2006. But where Andy Chavez beyond bailed him out the first time, there was no such luck in the sixth inning this time. Final ever game at Shea is an absolute crusher. A three and a half game lead on September 10th is a distant memory. The Mets would lose this game 4-2. to two. Ollie's contract expired, and he hit the open market that offseason. The Mets were very much in the market for a new starting pitcher that winter. Ben Sheets was a name that got linked to them, but he wasn't healthy enough to make something work for any team. Derek Lowe turned them down to go to Atlanta. Randy Wolf passed to go to LA. That left the big impact Mets rotation signing for 2009 as... Ollie. He signed a shiny new three-year, $36 million deal that offseason to stay with them. And right from the very second he could start to face hitters in 2009, it went terribly. 
Australia and South Korea ate him alive in the World Baseball Classic. He didn't even survive the first inning in an exhibition game against the Red Sox in New York right before the season started. His reaction? It was really cold. Dude, you've been pitching in Pittsburgh and New York for the last five years. With all due respect, because I really do like and respect Ollie, I'm going to take a wild guess that he had pitched in some chilly conditions before this. If anything, this was a sign of things to come for the next year. When he wasn't battling patellar tendinitis, a knee injury that cut his season in half, he was on the mound getting torched by opposing offenses. The highest ERA of his career to date is saying something, considering we've gone over some brutal rough patches in his career already. Things didn't get any better in 2010. His ERA did improve, though, by two points. The Mets desperately wanted to send him to the minor leagues to regain his confidence at least hopefully even have a chance to make an adjustment that would help him return to even just 2008 form, he said no. As was his right as a veteran player, but you almost gotta check your ego at the door and understand where the team is coming from with that. He had that level of understanding when Pittsburgh wanted to send him down to the minors, but not when the Mets wanted that. Is AAA Buffalo really that bad? If you're there in September, you could jump through a table with Bill's Mafia. They tried sending him to the injured list, saying his knee wasn't fully healed. That became a huge fight. They sent him to the bullpen. That didn't help. They basically just stopped using him altogether, and you guessed it, that didn't help either. He finished the season with zero wins and a whip over two with more walks than strikeouts. When the Mets brought him back on July 21st from the injured list, one reporter published a headline reading, Mets activate Ali, deactivate season. It looked that bad. They only used him in six more games down the stretch after that. His last, October 3rd, was the last day of the season. He hadn't appeared in a game in just shy of a month, went out there, and took the loss in the 14th inning in front of whatever crowd was left at City Field. I was one of those people. They only had him because they were afraid to eat his salary and afraid to see him succeed elsewhere. He'd spend his time in the clubhouse eating ice cream, listening to music, exercising, and watching TV. Plus the Mets every so often. He was exactly like me. Literally me. That describes me. The only difference is that he was a uniformed Mets pitcher, and I'm not, and I never will be. He wanted to pitch, the manager just hated him so much and thought he sucked so bad that he was denied that chance as often as humanly possible. As a 10-year-old little Mets fan at the time, I resented Ollie. The very thought or mention of him was enough to irritate me. In the winter of 2010, I was a 6th grader who really liked Kino Der Toten and really disliked Oliver Perez. Both of these statements wound up being completely outdated in the future. But that's 2010 for you. The Mets would release Ollie just before the 2011 season. What followed was a Bleacher Report article of 10 reasons it was better for the Mets. Imagine being so bad at your job that someone listed 10 reasons why it benefited your company to fire you. One of these 10 was that Ollie kinda seemed to realize that this was even in his own best interest. But with the Mets disaster over, it very well looked like his career would be over. At this point, he was just shy of 30 years old. He was coming off two straight years of an ERA at 680 or higher. He couldn't throw strikes. From the outside looking in, he seemed whiny and a bit unwilling to address the adversity he was facing head on. It looked like there could be a very real chance that it was pretty much just over for him. You could almost understand if a team just didn't think he was worth the trouble. Or he could just be banished to a bunch of different minor league type stops to the rest of his career in baseball. Now what if I told you his big league career wasn't even half over? Yeah. <laughs> Two days after the Mets banished Ollie out of the tri-state area entirely, he signed a minor league deal with the Washington Nationals. He did this in part because his pitching coach in Pittsburgh, where I guess I should remind you his peak was, now worked in the Washington organization. He would not pitch one big league game in 2011. So remember there were two problems with the Mets in 2010. One, he didn't want to go to the minor leagues. He spent the entire 2011 season in AA. Two, he didn't want to be in the bullpen. After a rough go of it in AA, that same guy who was Ollie's coach in Pittsburgh said he should become a reliever. I think failing again like this in AA gave Ollie new perspective. It humbled him. 
he was now finally willing to make these adjustments for the sake of his career. And after absolutely dealing in 23 relief appearances in the Mexican Winter League, a new era was about to begin. The Reliever Ali era. The Reliever era began officially with the Seattle Mariners in 2012. They gave him a minor league deal, he worked out some of the kinks down in AAA with them, and joined the big league bullpen in mid-June. He would pitch beautifully. He got his walks completely under control for, like, the first time in his whole career. His ERA would go all the way down to 212 in 29 and two-thirds innings. See, being a lefty who can get other lefties out makes you an extremely valuable bullpen piece. Even more so back in the day when there wasn't a three batter minimum. So Ollie was going to cruise in his new role as a lefty specialist. Who actually got righties out better than lefties, but that's not important I guess. But wait, hold up, new World Baseball Classic for Ollie to pitch in. Now there's a fight. Ollie got ejected from the World Baseball Classic, bro. Back from that, he re-upped with the Mariners for 2013. He wasn't as good as 2012, but he was a serviceable big league lefty out of their bullpen. No playoff stuff to speak of here. This is the 2002 to 2021 Mariners era we're talking about. We're in 87 plus loss Mariners territory here. Not the Julio Rodriguez is literally everyone's father world. I mean, one of Ollie's 2013 outings ended like this. See what I'm saying? Ali signed a two-year deal with the Arizona Diamondbacks before 2014. He was a really solid reliever there again. One time that year, the Phillies forced him to take his shirt off. I'd give you the context, but then that would just ruin the fun. Just enjoy the footage. Both in 2014 and 2015, he was very consistent out of the pen. But what I want to focus on is the obvious happening of Ali going back to the National League. He made his first appearances against the Mets on April 15th and 16th of 2014, not giving up a run in three innings across all of them. And then, on May 25th, he made his return to the City Field Mound in New York, where he got booed again, just like old times. He always handled it with good humor. He did. Uh, I wouldn't say always. Ali came in, threw an inning and a third of scoreless baseball, an escaped city field without the crowd burning him at the stake. Overall, a successful return to Queens. 2015 was very similar at large, but also very similar against the Mets. Three innings of work against them, no runs. You might be asking why I'm really just using Ollie's outings against one team as a summary for this entire stretch in Arizona, because it signified the changing of the guard in his career, a physical manifestation of his evolution. It represented the growth he had as a person and as a pitcher to be able to face the Mets in his first handful of seasons as a full-time reliever and just stuff them. In August of 2015, Ollie was traded to the Houston Astros as they worked on making their playoff push. He was really, really bad for the Astros. Including the postseason, he pitched 12 and a third innings across 24 games. He allowed 10 earned runs in those 12 and a third innings. His negative 0.7 wins above replacement in Houston was lower than his wins above replacement for the entire 2005 season. The broken toe year, in part because Ali couldn't get the job done when it mattered most, Houston was sent home in the ALDS that season, and they never went on to do anything people would talk about. You wish. Five years after getting that minor league deal from the Nationals with the hopes of joining a big league roster, Ali became a Washington National. I think Ali's most noticeable thing by the time he got to Washington was how full-on funky bullpen lefty he went. Phillies, by the way. Anyways, Oliver Perez had now completely completed his arc from young stud prospect to strikeout machine to weird crafty bullpen lefty. As a starter, the funkiest thing about him was how he'd jump over the first base line all the time. As a bullpen guy, oh yeah, he was moving in ways he'd never moved before. But the first memorable thing as a national he did was get a game-tying bunt in the 15th inning of a game, because of course it was. The second memorable thing was getting two hits at City Field against the Mets during a relief outing in July. Oh yeah, he shoved against the Mets too. Nine appearances versus the 2016 Mets, six and a third innings, three runs allowed. All three runs were in just one outing. Thanks, Wilmer Flores. This was the same game he had two hits in though, so still a net positive day against the Mets, honestly. He loved to own the Mets. 
The season at large wasn't amazing for Ali. It was easily his worst season as a full-time reliever so far, but what he did do was get outs when called upon in the postseason. No runs given up in four NLDS appearances for the 2016 Nationals. They didn't win the series, but Ali came up clutch when he was asked to the most. 2017 was eerily similar. Even though he managed to pitch in 50 games out of the bullpen without getting a win or a save, slightly below average ERA over four, no runs given up in the postseason, six and a third innings against the Mets with only two runs allowed. Jay Bruce hit the home run that time. No wait, I forgot, there was another World Baseball Classic in 2017 and Ali suited up for Team Mexico. Again, can't leave that out. To start 2018, Ali signed a minor league deal with the Reds. Okay, he then signed a minor league deal with the Yankees. Well, if that had worked out, it would have totally proven that his whole life purpose from here on out was to annoy the Mets. In June of 2018, he got a major league deal to be a reliever for the Cleveland Indians. You know how dominant and in control of his game Ali was in 2004? Let me just say that in 51 appearances as the lefty specialist for Cleveland in 2018, his strikeout to walk ratio was more than twice as good. The arc was now fully completed. He was probably the best lefty specialist in baseball, and his 139 ERA and 174 FIP backed that. Cleveland needed a proven veteran to carve lefties up, and he did exactly that. What made it even more impressive? You 36! He also became a master of having super slick mustaches, a staple of his time in Cleveland. The greatest thing to happen to Ali in 2018 was he became the very first pitcher in MLB history to pitch in a game without throwing a pitch. It had to do with intentional walks and the lack of a three batter minimum. I did a video on that already. That's exactly where I promised that this video would eventually get made. I don't want to rehash that story, so I recommend checking that one out after you're done here, because it's a mind bender. What also became a mind bender during his time in Cleveland, Ollie's hair went completely gray. Whoa! Damn! A physical representation of how long his career and this video have been. I love it. Jesse Sanchez published an article on MLB.com before the 2019 season profiling Ali and highlighting his newfound longevity. His keys to success and tips for physical longevity came down to a strong understanding of his own body, proper dieting, and regularly going mountain hiking. Teammates vouched that even at his age, he might have been the most energetic guy on the team. Genuinely, he lives a lifestyle I want to adopt key elements from at that age. 2019 was a solid year. It included a scoreless appearance at City Field as well. 2020 was really good, but really short. Don't have to remind you that that was the pandemic year. Don't have to remind Ali either. He took it upon himself to provide hundreds of meals to those in need in Mexico at the height of the virus. Ali loves Mexico, as his consistent attendance to the World Baseball Classic have gone to show. So I bet he takes a ton of pride in this accomplishment from 2020. Clinching the record for most MLB seasons played by a Mexican player. After five scoreless appearances in 2021, Ali got let go by Cleveland and played the rest of the season in the Mexican League. He was great there. And before 2022, he publicly stated that his plan was going to be going off into the sunset for one last ride in Mexico and Mexican winter ball, then retiring. We were officially at the end of the line. Until the Arizona Diamondbacks gave him a call and asked him to be in their big league bullpen. 2022, baby! It pains me to say it, but that stint in Arizona did not go very well. Seven earned runs in four innings across seven appearances twice getting victimized by the Mets. If that's not a sign that it was time to let go, I don't know what was. Arizona was left with no choice but cutting Ollie loose. But it was understandable. He was struggling badly, and he was now 40 years old. I watched his last appearance. It really did feel like the last time I'd ever see Ollie on a big league mound, And that made me sad. But I also basked in thinking about how unreal this journey was. His first big league strikeout was against second year Ichiro. His last big league strikeout was against Hasong Kim. Sorry, Storm. His first postseason out was recorded against Scott Spezio, and his last was against Kyle Higashioka. 
That's how far he came. That's how long he lasted. To some, Ali was completely invisible. You want to know why? He is the only player in MLB history to check all the following boxes. Played in 20 different seasons. All of those seasons were since Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier. Never made an all-star team. Never had MVP consideration. Never had Cy Young consideration. And never appeared in a World Series game. That is a disgrace. The casual fan may never have seen Ali once. He never made a dent in the national spotlight or national award recognition. And that is an absolute shame. Because the career I just laid out for you that he had was extraordinary. I was talking about Ali with SRS's own baseball historian, and he gave a great analogy that I got permission to steal. Sometimes in video games there can be like a painting of a giant clown on a wall in a room, and the code for that clown painting is actually so essential that if you take it out of the game code, the whole thing falls apart. You'd never know it, but that clown painting is a vital part of the system. Oliver Perez is baseball's video game clown painting. No one ever noticed, but he was always there and always doing stuff. He seemed dead to rights a decade ago and churned out a whole second full career as a bullpen piece on a bunch of good teams. He completely saved his image and his career after leaving New York with a bridge burn so bad it probably destroyed half the planet. But he won my respect, and he won the respect of the game. Also, I never told you how his 2022 went after leaving the Diamondbacks. He went back to Mexico, played the whole rest of the season there, and threw pretty well. A linchpin in the bullpen of the Toros de Tijuana for the second year in a row. And honestly, at 41 years old, I bet he's perfectly content with that, riding out the rest of his baseball days throwing competitively in Mexico until his arms and legs stop working, like he had envisioned before 2022 started. However, we've been down that road before. While there is a ton of reason to believe Ali's MLB career is over, he's worked through odds like this before. This is not the first time the deck seemed completely against him ever putting on a uniform again. He's been through too much and crawled out on the other side for me to ever count him out. There is a World Baseball Classic in 2023, so he very possibly could wind up showing his face on a mound there. What a fitting way to go that would be, if that's what ends up happening. If this is the end of the line, what a damn good run it was for Ali. I'm super appreciative to say that I was along for most of the ride, following his career with a close eye. But there has yet to be any word publicly about his future. We don't know what he really wants to do. What I can say is he has earned the luxury to do whatever in the world he wants with baseball. And for as long as he keeps chugging along, I'll be there every step of the way. On the mound and in life, whether he knows it or not, all of baseball and everyone who loves this game the same way he does will be there pulling for him too.